Welcome to today's webinar, which is the first in our new Workplace Relations webinar series. Uh, in this first webinar, we're of course talking all things gig economy. Uh, I'm, I'm Michael Cochran and I'm a Senior Associate uh, at, Wise, at um, KHQ Lawyers. And today I'm joined by Chris Giannardi, um, who heads up our team. And uh, Hello Chris, how are hey, you? Morning Michael, how are you? Morning everybody. Uh, and uh, Chris and I um, also have Josephine uh, Mamone uh, in with us today, assisting us fielding uh, any live questions that come through during the course of the webinar. Uh, firstly, just a, a few housekeeping matters before we do get underway. Um, a, a recorded version of this webinar will be made available to uh, everyone who has registered uh, today. And also, for those tuning in live, uh, you will have the ability to ask questions throughout the course of the webinar. So please do feel free to utilise that function. And uh, Chris and I will certainly do our best to, to answer um, as many questions as we can up front live. And of course, we're happy to stay around at the end of the webinar as well, or come back to you separately, um, depending on how many questions we do um, have come through. So the gig economy is certainly not new. It's, it's, it's a rather fluid concept and the extent of its operation in Australia is still quite difficult to really estimate with any certainty. What is agreed is that it is expanding rapidly and of course it does extend far beyond just the well-known companies like Uber, Airtasker and, and Deliveroo. And, and whilst its growth can, can largely be attributed to uh, the tech tech-driven emergence of these digital platforms, um, which are linking workers and organisations. Rock stars for hire and, and peace workers uh, have been around for some time. So the net effect of all this really is that it, it has resulted um, in recent times uh, for an increasing number of workers opting for specific or project uh, type engagements on a task by task or, or gig basis. Um, over traditional employer-employee relationships. So today, what uh, Chris and I will be looking at um, is how the gig economy actually fits within the way that work is being organised, uh, including the changing landscape of work, the current legal framework, some of the emerging gig trends from the test cases, uh, potential legislative changes that may come um, in the face of uh, an upcoming federal election uh, and really bringing this back to how this all affects your business. We'll also be sharing some of our insights and risk mitigation strategies on what your business should be doing if it is engaging with gig workers or if it plans to in, in the future. Yeah, sorry, Michael's pointing in my direction. I was only laughing because <laughs> he stole my word rock star already. <laughs> uh, so what is gig work? I mean, you'll see on the slide here that we have probably some of the more well-known um, gig companies and perhaps some of the less known ones there as well. There's hundreds or probably thousands more. Um, the, what is gig work? The Senate committee report um, uh, has in September 2018 described uh, the gig economy as essentially being digitally enabled marketplaces, which um, uh, uh, such platforms that act as intermediaries using algorithms to connect individual workers with end users uh, in order to seek specific services. And that um, selects um, Senate committee report uh, talked about four characteristics, which um, included high levels of irregularity uh, shaped customer demand, Two, part of the capital is actually provided by workers. Three, work is frequently paid on a piece rate basis. And four, uh, it's arranged and or facilitated via online uh, and or mobile platforms. Chris, what, what do you think about that, that definition? Well, that apart, apart from being slightly <laughs> overwritten by a bunch of Labor politicians <laughs> who form the majority, I mean, look, it, it, it's the modern expression of what um, gig economy work appears to look like. I mean, I think that the, the real 
thing to extend, which we'll, we'll come to everybody in a second, is, is also thinking beyond the technology. I mean, the technology is the latest emanation of it, but one of the things we will come to in a sec is just where it extends out to any number of, you know, people within the age profile of the workforce who do gigs for work. Uh, sorry, that's my rock star theme. Of, you know, I can, you, know, you can which dip I've in stolen. And, yeah, dip, <laughs> dip in and dip out. And uh, to the extent that that might be a special expertise, of, you know, I think your example, Michael, early, will, will be gig CFOs and whatnot mm -hmm. as well. But, you know, the, the ability to actually live from, you know, hand to mouth. To, to actually say I'm prepared to accept my fee for this work and then I'm gonna, I, I just need a marketplace. And the hardest thing that's always been a feature of contracting work generally is where do I find my marketplace? And the new digital world has just provided this incredible ability to tap into with the factory in your pocket. So there's a number of top, uh, types of gig economy models. The rise of the on-demand uh, business models is really behind the gig economy. Uh, there's three basic types of model. Um, there's the online gig workers, which are really those who are using these new technologies, which um, Chris is talking about, new markets, new platforms for various types of work arrangements. So that's your, your Ubers and your various food delivery services um, being the well-known examples. We then have uh, the sharing economy models, which uh, really relates to underutilized assets um, being used more via online marketplaces. And some examples of those include Airtasker, uh, Airbnb, and, and several car share, car share models as well. The third category there um, is workers which uh, have alternative work arrangements to employment. Um, such as your independent contractors and your temp slash contingent workers. These are actually long established arrangements. They're not new, uh, but it's really the developments in technology and worker and employer preferences, which we'll talk about shortly, which have just made them easier to implement um, and therefore more popular. So next we just want to talk about what's actually happening in the way that um, uh, work is being performed uh, and what, what's really driving this global gig trend. Um, apart from the tech side, today's modern workforce really does have uh, a different mindset and there, it, it does appear to be more of a focus on experiences and flexibility rather than stability. Um, this is actually a really important uh, thought which we'll come back to later in the webinar because it links back to some of the gig risk management strategies that um, that we'll go through shortly. Chris, do you have any thoughts on um, what's driving uh, this global trend other than those types of things? Well, I think it's the breakdown of markets. Mm. I think that um, there is a rise of skills that are available and I think people ask themselves the question, well, why, just because I'm a, you know, <clears throat> at the moment it's always been fine for landscape gardeners to operate from gig to gig and it's okay for lawyers to operate from gig to gig and I think people want to, Get in on the action. I think they say, "Well, I'm. I mean, I, I used Airtasker for our footy dads, you know, face painting last year." Sure. And it's like, "There's the number of people out there who can face paint for kids is extraordinary." Had some basic requirements <laughs> on working with children and the like, but um, why not? Like, I, I think well done. I mean, if you're willing to put yourself out there and get a fee for your work, all power to you. Mm. And I, I really want to come to the changing economics of employment and gig in due course. Sure, sure. So I guess the next question is who are our gig workers? So apart from the popular image of the, the gig economy worker being your, your local Uber driver, uh, the trend is definitely finding its way into other areas. So it, it can now be used in a range of roles, whether it's junior administrative roles and hospitality, right up to senior and, and highly technical roles. And as Chris was mentioning before, it's, it's even becoming um, valuable as a, an interim executive solution um, through uh, the use of technology. So gig CFOs, gig CTOs can really be an effective um, opportunity for organisations to perhaps bring in skills um, and other IP that they might have not had access to previously. Um, and might have not otherwise been able to uh, achieve or access through permanent employees. Are there any other types, Chris, as to um, 
the gig workers that you know we're sort of dealing with at the moment other than those or no i think that's good spread of categories i, I yeah. think that they're, they're it's more the touch points of you know have they i mean at least for us have they touched the legal system yet mm. and <laughs> that, that it's like the great unknown sure um so why are so many businesses these days opting to engage gig workers or at least considering to do to do so it, it really comes back to well, what are the benefits so there's there's a whole range uh, and apart from perhaps the the obvious um cost savings uh benefits potentially of not retaining permanent employees um there are other benefits too and um some of those include having to um uh, only hire workers when they're actually needed uh it also as i said before gives businesses access to expert specific skills on particular projects that uh, don't come up uh, perhaps as regularly as others. It's also much quicker and, and, and faster uh, to hire uh, gig workers um, uh, in most cases than um, compared to via your traditional recruitment uh, methods. Certainly there can be a division up into smaller tasks as well uh, when using gig workers, um, which are best suited to each worker. The, the net effect of this is there's perhaps less downtime for businesses as well. Uh, and there's also that ability to attract more talented um, workers to your business that you wouldn't otherwise be able to um, achieve perhaps through um, um, employment avenues. Are there any other businesses, do you think, uh, do any other benefits, Chris, do you think that um, we're seeing with our clients that are either you know, operating or considering to um, access, you know, this gig workforce. Yeah, I think you should all. I think you should all really look at it in the concept. I think it's important to be expansive in looking at it in the context of the life cycle of work and the mm. uncertainty of, you know, launching a business of any kind. And you know, it's really easy. You know, you know put on your old industrial hat out there and you look to your unions and whatnot who think that, well, you know, there's a revenue stream and therefore you're making money and therefore, um, you know. I'm entitled to, you know, lots of stuff, which is great, as I should. I mean, in the sense of they're participating in a business. So I think that when you look at it from your, your business's perspective, it just where is my life cycle and, and where am I trying to innovate in challenging markets? I don't have volume to speak of. I'm not sure I knew where the advertising or marketplace was that I was going to get into. And yet I need to draw really specialist skills in low volumes or, you know, hope, what hopefully become very high volumes really quickly and where we see it in sort of the, at least the modern economy is you know everything from you know we're not making widgets in factories anymore where you can predict the production run of you know however many thousand a day or something like that it might be you know articles in a newspaper it might be um uh, as i say face painting i've already had one text message on the why thanks matt for face painting in a CLA. <laughs> um but um it, where your actual product is seeking to attract a new market and and you can't literally afford the skills or be aware of the volume without going out the back door to know that um, I want to be able to access what this person can provide. So, you know, I'll post it on a job board. Like it, yeah. Online marketplace, yeah. that's right. Sorry, job, yeah, does that, oh, there's like that Senate report with workers. I mean, it's just infused with, you know, let's bring all the old industrial language into it and I just did again, so there you go. <laughs> All right, so central to the gig economy is the idea that, that workers are independent contractors and, and not traditional employees. So um, determining whether a worker is an employee or a contractor is of course based on um, the well-accepted multifactorial tests um, with a number of factors that have come from uh, case law. The, the indicia is summarized in that table and. Uh, it is uh, a, a, an exercise of if you are um, a yes in the left-hand side of the category, in more cases than not, you're likely to be considered an employee. Uh, and the reverse applies if you are a yes in the um, other side, uh, the right-hand side, the independent contractor side, you're likely to be an independent contractor. Um, the, the tension, of course, um, for the gig economy is that sometimes gig workers don't fit neatly into either uh, column. 
Uh, and that tension has been um, brought up in a number of the um, very publicised uh, Fair Work Commission cases um, regarding whether a gig worker is an independent contractor or an employee. Um, so, Chris, I guess you know the, the, the question is why does this actually matter? Mm. Uh, it matters for a number of reasons, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, it does, and you can see why a number of people then think to themselves, "Oh, this is great." From a business perspective in both ways mm. because you know it comes down to cost and regulation deep mm. down i mean mm. god if you're not an employee you're not covered by the fair work act mm. um if you're um and the, the fair work act as you all know <coughs> online creates a wealth of obligations from minimum wages to enterprise bargaining to you know union act entry into workplaces through to um you know and, and you see a field of law trying to catch up, mm. like superannuation and workers' compensation, where yep. it was always applicable to employees. And, and payroll tax. Payroll tax. Um, now there's, you know, sort of extended contracting <coughs> provisions, but mm. they're very limited compared sure. to, you know, the polis bolus ways in which an employee is going to be caught up in it. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the risk of getting it wrong is huge. It's huge. <laughs> uh, apart from your, your, your sham contracting, there are you know, a number of other legislative regimes that you can also fall foul of. Um, so we'll come back to these points, obviously, in the risk mitigation um, and, and gig management piece later in the webinar, but getting it right uh, now and in the future is, is really important if you're operating this space or considering um, engaging with the gig workforce. And can, I make, can I make a point as well for all of you that you know, the courts are getting, and the commission is getting much better, not just in the Uber case and the Fedora case and whatnot, which we'll come to in a second, but they're getting much better at grappling with the notion of well, what what does the look and feel of a business or someone in business look like? I mean, the, the, fundamentally, all these factors all turn back to a, 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 a kind of huh, the, the vibe. Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, got it in. Thank yep. you. Uh, <laughs> drink for me. Um, the, the vibe, of, and it's not a vibe, it's actually a a hard edged view of is this person independently in business for themselves and doing things that they control and that they run and they've got their own, not you know, and that seeks into things like have they got their own trading name, but is mm -hmm. that real? Have they got multiple customers? Are they, and, and the court in the, one of the most recent cases, like have they got their own goodwill? Mm -hmm. And you know, you can sort of see how that easily feeds into, you know, high expertise work or specialist work. You can sort of see the goodwill, you know, very clearly that that person has, um, you know, low expertise work, labouring work, repetitive work. Um, and so, well, what what goodwill have they actually generated in their business? So, um, you know, thinking about your relationships with people all the time in terms of gig workers should always be, um, well, how would I treat any other business in this way? The landscape gardener that comes into my house, the plumber that comes into my house. Uh, yeah, things to think about when we get towards risk mitigation strategies. So most of our audience uh, tuning in today or, or listening uh, to the recorded version later on will be aware of uh, these key test cases which uh, have come up in the Fair Work Commission concerning both Uber and Foodora, um, which have considered the key issue as to whether or not uh, those particular gig workers are employees or indeed independent contractors under the current legal tests um, that we have. So the 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 two uber um, the two uber cases uh have uh, both found that uh the uber drivers um were not employees uh in the first 2017 case um deputy president gostinik held that uh the uber driver was an independent contractor uh and didn't meet the jurisdictional bar to bring an unfair dismissal case what what was key in that decision was um, that the uh, driver um, had control over the way in which he wanted to conduct the services he provided. He chose when to log in and off um, the Uber partner app. Uh, he had control over the hours that he wanted to work and he could accept or refuse trip, trip requests with some caveats. There was also equipment, uniform, and um, his uh, ability to register for and pay for GST and remit other tax liabilities that came into play. That decision was then followed again in 2018. So certainly as we see it at the moment, it's accepted, at least in Australia, 
in contrast to some overseas ju jurisdictions, that our Uber drivers are um, independent contractors under current tests. Yeah, it's fascinating when you make these things transparent, that mm. you actually, you know, they sort of see terms of their various contracts. Yeah. And, um, one of those contracts, which I, I do wonder now is ride sharing, I suppose it's itself being validated by, you know, the government setting up ride sharing zones and taxi zones at airports and things like that to sort of like almost labour hire licensing and mm. validating the model of labour labour hire <coughs> as not creating some other form of employment or contracting relationship. But um, one of the interesting contractual terms was um, they're not allowed to wear a uniform and they're not allowed to put an Uber sign mm. on their vehicle, at least in these earlier, I guess, well, maybe these Early earlier form yeah. contracts that have mm. now sort of found their way into these decisions. And, you know, because you do see, and I guess the reason for raising the airport is you do see a car approaching now in the airport precinct that says Uber, because yep. I wonder just how many people in the airport are driving up pretending to be Uber drivers to do a better drop off at Melbourne mm. Airport rather than uh, having to wait out in the public section. But anyway. You do see those little black, use on yeah. Uber cars now. Yeah. So yeah. sign. That's right. Um, so then in contrast to the Uber cases, we have the Foodora test cases, which uh, has effectively seen Foodora exit the Australian market. So the recent um, commission case regarding a Foodora worker found that the delivery rider was an employee and not an independent contractor. And that was despite the Foodora uh, de uh, delivery rider having signed an independent contractor agreement. Mm. Um, so it, it really does show that, you know, applying the same test to another type of gig worker um, can sometimes determine a different result. Um, uh, we then have the second case quoted there, which is currently in the federal court, uh, which is interesting because uh, the proceedings were actually issued by the Fair Work Ombudsman as to sham contracting and uh, underpayment of entitlements um, prior to Foodora exiting the market. So, uh, of course, Foodora is now subsequently filed for voluntary administration and a deed of company arrangement was entered into uh, in early December. Now, despite all this, the Ombudsman has said that it, it, it intends to continue the proceeding against Food Dora given the importance of the outcome. So that is set to resume in June 2019. It'll be really interesting to see um, whether, whether, they, whether, whether they're <laughs> under the deed of company arrangement, they just withdraw their consent <laughs> yeah. to participate in the proceedings. But yeah. um, I, I think, I mean, it's if you actually set this <clears throat> against history and sort of development of, you know, the first kind of gigs, so to speak, that will transition from the employment context to, um, you know, sort of contract basis were, you know, were in trades and then followed by kind of transport. And so you can sort of see how Foodora itself um, it, with bicycle riders, you know, this is not the first bicycle rider or motorbike rider case that ever came up. I mean, the High Court case in Babu is about bicycle couriers. So it comes somewhat, I would have thought, infected with, or at least pregnant with, um, in a better way, with, with history in the past of what the person was that, that they were doing. And I think Foodora in particular, as you know, well, question can be asked, well, what, what was the real distinction between the Uber case and the Foodora case? And re it really turned on control. Foodora has seen in mm. their contracts to exhibit, you know, an inordinate amount of control about the starting right. time of shifts and, um, you know, mm. when they became unavailable and, Whereas Uber really have taken a completely hands off, like we'll just find someone else approach if you don't want to do it, that's okay. Whereas Fedora very strictly, um, it was interesting via its metrics. And I think the commission actually concluded in that case that whilst it doesn't say we can, you know, the, the contract said we don't control you, the reality was via an absolute web of metrics and being kicked off for any failure against any of those, you would um, you know, exhibit that kind of control anyway. So there has been some um, key or, or recent inquiries um, of recent times in relation to uh, gig work and the gig economy. There was the Senate Select Committee report um, in September 2018, which is obviously a, a Labor-led Senate report, uh, the majority report. And in September, um, uh, it, it, the report was tabled and that found that there was a growth of non-standard employment, uh, including gig economy work, which was having a significant impact on Australian 
uh, workplaces with regular full-time employment now estimated as representing less than 50% of total employment in Australia. Uh, the uh, Labor-led committee also rejected assertions that uh, workers who perform tasks in the gig economy are independent contractors in the uh, true spirit of the term. And uh, as Chris laughs, <laughs>, laughs, they didn't, you, they didn't quote uh, the castle, no. Uh, and the committee uh, recommended that the Australian government, um, uh, in addition to a number of other um, uh, recommendations, um, amend the definition of employee to capture gig workers so that um, they would have the same full protections under Australia's industrial system. So. There was a dissenting report um, uh, by the Libs and, and Nationals, uh, and um, it, uh, in, it in, in that report, uh, in the dissenting report, um, noted that um, the Select Committee report failed to recognise some credible evidence that was presented to the, um, to the Senate to uh, show inequality is not actually rising and um, that the share of casual work has actually been relatively stable mm. since the 1990s. Australia's got a long history of um, providing offset arrangements to, to make it cheaper to employ young people, uh, the disabled, the, the untrained, um, and indeed, you know, long-standing view of casual work and the need for top-up labour. And it's really a kind of a feature of our economy, really. And being, if you kind of reach back to, you know, kind of first principles of the tyranny of distance and, you know, a, a small dispersed geography and not much volume in your markets. We've always needed to have a labour system that dealt with, um, you know, rising and falling demand. Mm. Uh, and um, we'll just mention that there is also a Victorian inquiry um, uh, into the on-demand workforce, which is being chaired by the former uh, work, Fair Work Ombudsman. Um, and the final report, is expected in late 2019. Yeah, I think as well that, one, and one thing, and this is sort of briefly mentioned in the Liberal report, the dissenting report in the, for the Senate, but also generally in um, the kind of regulatory space as a whole, not, not just in the gig economy, but what, what is the impact of technology? And, um, you know, you can write a law and it can be out of date. And then, so they, then the next generation of that was to write technology neutral laws and then they're now out of date and now we're actually finding that you know you can make a law to say say for example you know chain of responsibility in cha transport keep people safe by doing risk assessment and whatnot on a workers compensation model and along comes a telemetry system for you know driver fatigue and and driver uh, truck performance and you see every aspect of what's going on you kind of go well, maybe the law should just be implement one of these systems and you would probably do that other than the fact that a new system will come along next week that will change it again. So um, the, the one thing that Libs picked up in, in their side of the report was just, are we missing by throwing the baby out of the bathwater and making it all about old industrial relations practices? Are, are we missing the opportunity to, you know, for technology and innovation across our economy? Yes. So very briefly, um, some unions have negotiated privately with various bodies in relation to gig or on-demand workers. The two uh, most publicised examples of that are uh, the TWU and Coles have signed an MOU in relation to workers in the on-demand economy. Um, and one of the principles under that MOU is that on-demand workers should not be prohibited from accessing the same rights as other workers. The second, um, uh, uh, most publicised example uh, probably is the unions, New South Wales and Airtasker, um, doing a deal back in April 2017 um, as to um, agreeing all recommended rates of pay on Airtasker will be comparative um, award rates. Chris, interested to hear your thoughts as to whether or not this was sort of the right move by these organisations or potentially will it come back to bite them um, if there's legislative change, change in government, um, and, yeah. and the unknown future. In a move of inspiration, I actually want to uh, send a note to Josie and just let me know what, what the poll result is out there. But um, yeah, my, I, I just think that um, it's obvious that some organisations like a, a Coles or a, a market exposed, sorry, a brand exposed business 
you know, and, and the, the real thrust politically at the macro level into supply chain, you know, Kmart's come under attack for overseas work and um, or RFC sourcing of work. And, you know, the, the major T1, you know, ASX top 10 sort of companies are, are all very brand sensitive and will always sort of say everything's fine. We're not, we're not, I think what the latest thing in franchising is that there's, you know, another Senate report that says, oh, you know, these whole systems are designed around kind of worker fraud and wage theft. And, you know, they're, they're kind of systematic in their nature. I, I don't know whether it is or it isn't, but, you know, once you, you know, in my view, what the unions want us to do here is engage with them to drag us into, you know, back into their world, into their system. And it's not about whether you're union or not, you know, I don't really care. Uh, completely agnostic. It's just about how, um, you know, whether business accesses the resources it needs in, you know, in, and the definitions of fairness are so loose. And, you know, one, you know, one person's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. And um, to that extent, um, if you do, if you do engage, um, you, you're stepping onto the slippery slope because I think that these organisations will find out. So, Chris is going to make me buy a coffee after this for quoting another one of his uh, um, statements that he mentioned before. But we are in a time where it's an empire strikes back moment, and some form of change is coming. Um, and uh, there's a number of possible outcomes. Um, the first I just wanted to put um, was, Chris, that you know, obviously there's a, a potential to review the definition of casual work in the aftermath of skiing and, and work pack. You know, can you see any way that that will um, potentially infect you know, the gig economy and be seen as a way that um, that can bring um, current contractors into um, the employment um, sphere. Yeah, I think it can because there's a, at the moment, there's a slippery slide you guys will notice out there with respect to, you know, obviously casual employment. Then you step into, well, not just casual employment, but labour hire mm. casual employment. Uh, then you go from labour hire casual employment and labour hire licensing, um, you know, and, and you see across, you know, Queensland started its labour hire licensing scheme and it was all about just labour hire. Um, South Australia can be, but we are just listening to the new Victorian regulator talk about, um, you know, in it, certain sectors where contracting is starting to become prevalent for people and people are being exploited. And it's like, well, hang on a minute, let's just go back in that change of language from labour hire to contracting, um, you know, and then once you get into the world of contracting, well, you're right into gig economy space. I mean, at what point, in this new kind of regulatory licensing world to uh, eventually uh, are all contractors going to have to be licensed and that, you know, we've, we've still got the national labour hire licensing scheme to come after the federal election, which both parties now say um, they're going to do. Once you get into the, you know, once the, they get into the territorial debate over the definitions of casual employment and they get into the territorial debate over what is labour hire and what is contracting, um, you, 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 no, they're just fighting over distinctions, really. Um, and the courts are still waiting in the background, you know, in Workpack and Skeen overall. The court said, well, I don't care what you say, um, you determine between the parties your identities were, is it, you know, are you a contractor, an employee, or a casual, or a full timer? The courts always reserve to themselves the, um, the ability to objectively determine from the circumstances what they say was the true nature of the relationship. Mm. So some other you know, key themes that we're seeing is that there's this push to introduce new um, WHS, WHS work, workplace health and safety and superannuation legislation to cover non-standard work, um, broadening the definition of employee to capture gig workers, cracking down on sham contracting. I mean, the, the difficulty we have, isn't it, Chris, that we, we, we have a number of legislative regimes and you know, it's all very well to say, well, expand the definition, but it's going to have to apply across you know, state and federal uh, legislature. Yeah, so it's almost a return to, a return to kind of um, federal state relations. Mm. And, you know, if, you, if we come up with a new wave of, you know, state and territory legislation across all jurisdictions and then the need to wrestle with that with national businesses, um, you know, and it's interesting that really if you look at kind of, again, the history of some of this stuff, New South Wales has always led the way in sort of accepting contracting and, and whatnot, it, you know, Victoria, far less so. Mm. 
Um, and yet, and so, you know, where you see the hybrid legislation most prevalent, it's in New South Wales. And it's going to be interesting to see whether, you know, if there are national models adopted, whether or not they pick up hybrid models that recognise the existence of um, you know, gig economy and therefore try and force fit it into a subset of employment, or do they just holes bolus bring it in? You think at this point of the regulatory life cycle, they're just trying to get the concept in that we can regulate gig workers and sort of what they would call dependent contractors mm. um, such that um, we get them into the regulatory system and maybe it's a change for another day. You know, last you know, this year's compromise will become next year's grievance. <laughs> to justify another law change uh, that pushes the boundaries further. Now I'm probably talking a bit dramatically and a bit over the top, but it, you know, and you can only plan in your businesses right now for what you want to do. Uh, it, if you're getting caught in a scenario where the regulatory vice is closing on you, and we seem to be in that particular time of the political cycle, yes. then <laughs> um, you know what, what was it? Yeah, oh, we're talking about. Well, Michael and I were talking about whether it's kind of. Empire strikes, Empire strikes back, back and maybe there'll be a return of the Jedi one day. Yeah. Who knows, someone might make a whole new set of uh, sequels. So this is probably the most important part of the webinar next, um, this next discussion. So look, it, it really isn't um, enough just to clarify the employment status anymore. It, it's also a, a really big mistake to, to simply use contingent workers in the gig economy only because you want to avoid the obligations of them becoming employees. So what I want to talk about, Chris, is really how does one adapt their business um, to the gig economy and, and really effectively manage or reduce their risk? Uh, the, the first one I want to put on the, the table is that um, there's, there's really this need for ongoing review of your, your gig or your contingent uh, cohort, isn't there? In, um, reviewing your, your workforce to consider whether or, um, any gig or contingent workers are more appropriately classified as employees. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that leading question with gusto. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, and, and the reason for that is really because the courts are standing in the background with a, um, you know, ultimately with a flaming sword. Um, and it, it, when parties lose the ability to define between themselves what the status of their um, um, relationship is, it's quite scary that when you actually stand back from the legal system as a whole as well, I mean, you know, you publish a nice new shiny law or you put the ink on a nice new shiny contract and, or indeed still you've done, you know, something even less certain with your terms of business by agreeing to some tech enabled website that just sort of says, you know, um, you know, Matthew will turn up at nine o'clock and do your face painting for you. You kind of start to realise at that point in the, at, oh my God, there's a whole bunch of questions I actually haven't asked them. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, what are the terms of business? What, what are, you know, are you coming to think that you're working for me and you're going to expect something else in the future? Are you, um, uh, you know, bigger still, and, and uh, hopefully we get to this as a whole too, but what if it all goes bad? What's mm -hmm. the, who, who's, who's, has he got professional indemnity insurance? Has mm -hmm. he got public liability performance when he sticks the, paintbrush in the kid's eye. Uh, I'm not sure I'm, you know, got enough sausages on the barbecue at $2.50 to cover that. Yeah, I mean, that's right. We, we need to talk about these risk mitigation strategies in the context of the entire life cycle perspective from before engagement, um, engagement, uh, during the engagement and ending the engagement. Just touching your know, going further into the review. I mean, it's all uh, good and well to say, well, go, go and review your um, uh, your, your, your workforce, but what does it actually mean? Is how and how does a, a business undertake that task? I mean, isn't it changing perhaps um, uh, maybe some long-term accepted perceptions of oh well, we've got all these pay-as-you-go contractors over mm -hmm. here; they've been good for forever, so they'll just continue to be good. Isn't it about just sort of breaking down so they go well? There's nothing wrong with doing an internal audit um, of your higher-risk categories and potential other parts of the business where you are looking to bring in um, different types of workers. I, I mean, that's that's the sense of what we're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, it's actually, and, and the starting point in that, to not try and take it too early in the life cycle, and it's probably gonna sound a bit trite to say it, but you've gotta know your own organization first. I mean, we, we how we categorize things, particularly in bigger organizations, when you're trying to manage by policy and systems, and you know, you've got different silos of payroll looks after one thing, or vendor management looks after another thing, and you know, when you know 
managers around the, the place are, are really <coughs> loose with, oh, well, I just want to make sure that they get their annual leave. And it's like, well, hang on a minute. <laughs> well, let's just take, you know, back the car right up and say, well, have we engaged them through the appropriate process in our company? Um, have we, um, do we actually have functions within our organisation who can look cross silo and, you know, and stick their nose into payroll from time to time and say, well, these people have moved along. I mean, that, you know, naturally falls with HR from an employment perspective, but not necessarily from a vendor management perspective. And um, I think that enabling a, you know, without creating too much red tape already with your own business, which is the red tape you're trying to avoid in having gig workers in the first place is um, what, what can we put in place that can reasonably manage the risk within our ability to know ourselves, yeah. And that's often overlooked. Yeah, so I mean, that leads nicely into sort of the second strategy, which is really educating stakeholders. Um, uh, and particularly those who are responsible for hiring within the business. And as Chris was saying, that might not always be just HR, it might be procurement. Mm -hmm. It might be people dealing with um, contractors. So really um, there is an education piece there and making sure that those stakeholders within the business um, uh, uh, you know, are brought up to date with what the qualities of gig workers are and, and indeed those traditional tests that we went through earlier as to um, whether or not someone might shift from the independent contractor side into the employee side. Yeah. And in, uh, smaller, in smaller business as well, where you're really agile and you're, you know, you're wearing <coughs> three or four different hats um, and it's just about, you know, the work rather than the compliance mm. that sits behind the work. Um, you know, if anything, we're, we're in a bit of a twilight period where we're getting too used to, you know, the you know, well, quote unquote, the acceptability of gig work and, you know, the, the, the regulatory schemes and the parliament and whatnot are catching up at a rapid rate of knots. We, the, the threshold questions that, you know, people need to be asking themselves and maintaining, even in small businesses, just some basic systems of saying, well, what, basic guidelines. What are the terms yeah. of engagement here yeah. for a start? Um, what, you know, what, uh, and that can see into other things like what uniform they're wearing or will we invite them to the Christmas party <laughs> at the end of the year? Um, but um, the, uh, when, when you're trying to be agile, analysis often gets forgotten. And I know you don't want to necessarily do that in your business all the time. But, um, you know, if you're starting to repeat using the same person, that itself is a good lead indicator of some time to just keep your, begin to keep your eye on it. Uh, you're using them more and more and more, and then they're asking for leave off from time working in your business. It's another waypoint again. We should, you know, just a little flag going up flagpole to say, "Hang on a minute, I think we're probably at another review point here." So we also need to consider the industry sector, don't we? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a difference between a, a gig worker potentially in the hospitality industry um, compared to potentially a professional. Um, gig worker. So, I mean, yeah, that has DJs, to be, DJs are allowed to be gig workers. <laughs> a bar <laughs> <may not. laughs> no, into, that's right. Yeah. So, um, you know, there has to be consideration of that in the engagement um, stage of the life cycle, yeah. doesn't there? The other, um, which is, is similar consideration, considering different levels of expertise. So, again, you know, if we've got someone who's, you know, a, a delivery driver or, a, or working in hospitality, or um, uh, working in a junior role as compared to, you know, a senior interim executive gig worker, you know, that comes into play, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and, and, and there'll be historically accepted notions of that. I mean, it's funny that the, the, the gig economy itself needs to, you know, create a new history of, of what might found to be gig or not gig. And I think expertise is actually at the heart of it. One of the really interesting things I came across recently was the notion of gig sales workers for a client. Mm. And, that, and that was, well, a person who comes in and does sales and they're running their own business sounds, sounds counterintuitively like, well, they, it's just, they, you know, they're, they're, they're like, running sales for someone else, yeah, but that's, yeah, that's but the business. And you can really be a professional yeah. salesperson, but they look historically more mm. like a person who, you know, works for Amway, the local vacuum cleaner company, and probably delivers newspapers, and they do 
five or six different gigs to get around and probably knock doors for charity as well. But you know, the, the professional salesperson, I mean, there's, I think though, you know, sales people themselves need to articulate and, and I think, well, they should and can because, you know, I think business development and marketing and the kind of what you would regard to be the higher expertise level end of sales. Mm. I think it's a great example where you kind of stop bringing your historically preordained views to what expertise exists in sales or not. There's a high degree of expertise in sales. I mean, why else are we all online trying to work out how to, you know, run a, you know, a business sales conversation? Yeah. Um, but that narrative needs to be written by those people themselves, which seeks to us in terms of, well, how can I risk manage that in my business? Ask the question of the person. I mean, I'm obviously looking around for someone, but I might be looking around for them because I just have a low volume in sales right now and I can't afford to take someone on full time. But ask them the question, well, what, what expertise, you know, or, or how do you think you can do this differently for me? That itself is great evidence in a court case of, I was looking for something more than cheap. Mm. So the next one probably sounds like an obvious one, but considering the appropriate engagement model, you really do have an opportunity at the outset hmm. to set the course and the correct course. So if you've got concerns about um, uh, the, uh, the classification, well, get them on the contract, uh, get them on the con get correct contract at the outset. It seems like an obvious one, but we often see it um, trip up our clients, don't we, as far as uh, allowing a relationship to continue just because it may have been set on the wrong path initially. and no, Or no contract. Or no contract, and that's right. right. Even just a one-pager. Yeah. Or understand. You know, and it's not determinative, no. but it is, a relevant, um, it is a relevant factor in the weighing up of the indicia. And you don't, on a digital platform, you know, as you all know out there, you don't. You know, uh, I confess that I looked at the air tasker in terms of engagement, but <laughs> being the lawyer that I am, I couldn't help but you just write in the comment. No, 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 no. Except the terms and conditions. Oh, that, that'd be, yeah, I'm usually that way. No, no, there's six. You know, the, in the, the, there was a comments area. And it was like, cool, I can, I'm going to write in the comments what I'm expecting. Not, you know, in any attempt at legalese language or even numbered or anything like that, but it's like, no, no, what are the critical parts of my engagement? And, um, you know, start expectations and um, even basic stuff like that helps guide. I mean, it, it's an important, not not decisive, but it's an important factor with a court. Yeah. And it's interesting, those Uber and Fedora cases, how they, you know, analysed termination provisions as, you know, because they could terminate if they did certain things, that that sounded more like employment. It's like, well, that's probably a bit biased. I mean, what commercial contract doesn't have a termination mm -hmm. provision in it for cause of some description? So... Um, I think the commission might have got it wrong, at least in the way that it weighed those considerations. So the next part in the life cycle is during the engagement. And there are some practical steps or strategies that you can implement um, to ensure that you keep the course um, in addition to just starting out on the right course. And, and that is you, you know, we can implement breaks in engagements, can't you, in, in different projects for gig and, and contingent mm -hmm. workers. I mean, that is an effective strategy of making sure that you're keeping the course and, and not falling into, you know, potential permanent employment um, relationship. Yeah, continue the theme. I mean, you, you, uh, one of our strong pieces of advice, you know, for managing contractors generally or um, managing labour hire or agency labour is often as well. I mean, if you actually apply those models and bring it into this kind of gig economy environment, it's like, well, you know, ask for, ask for the work for labour hire, not a particular person. Mm. Um, treat them consistently. So if, you know, you've got a, you know, the number of businesses you come, I, I come across that hand out identification cards and have an employee number on it, even for contractors. I mean, that's, I must say, that's probably getting a bit out of date now. I think people have caught up with that a lot. But, you know, that, or, 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 you know, we're putting on a party and we just want everyone to come who's involved in our business. Um, and so we send out the invites sort of unwittingly to all our, internal workforce, quote unquote, mm. and that might take in a whole bunch of other people. Um, you know, you can get into any like numbers of granular level within a business, but um, thinking through um, just you know, briefly how we categorise them and, and treat them slightly differently. These are all the little bits of, you know, in the, you know, the proverbial one percenters on the footy field that will swing a case. So, you know, another practical step is really asking your gig workers um, where appropriate if they are 
dealing with other clients mm. other than the business that, um, other than your business. Uh, of course, if they are, I would suggest that they're legitimate contractors under uh, under the current mm. tests. And that leads into things as well like um, trading names and, um, you know, do they have advertising? Are they holding own? themselves out as being out there available to other businesses. Yeah. In the lead sham contracting case for Roy Morgan, it's a case heard in the federal court, um, it, it was really about well, even less so, I mean, they, they didn't look at the indica these indicators, but but also just, you know, what, what was the emanation of the business? So um, asking them who their other clients are, you know, making it about, you know, their time coming into the business, into your business rather than, well, I need you here every day um, and emphasising to them that they're free to work for other people. I mean, if you actually look, you know, that I was saying earlier, that Uber, that Uber decision rides so heavily on, yeah. on the, the ability of the driver to control when and when they accepted work. Yeah. So there's also the ability to, to design the business structure and the jobs and the workplace itself to, to suit gig work. So, you know, it shouldn't, necessarily be exactly this you, know, you might have a gig worker um, who is performing um, similar work to an employee in the office next door I mean how, how can one go about um, uh, ensuring that you know they're not treated exactly the same and that you are um, apply you know you are implementing um, the, 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 the right type of structure to ensure that they are truly a gig worker if they've been engaged as such. So I'm, I'm smiling because I'm just thinking <laughs> I mean, about... No, 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 I'm smiling because I just think, is this, a, is, this a, is this about going into open plan and, and, and not having an office? Uh, but, oh, look, basic things. You know, it, it, are they, is there a hot desk area? You know, yeah. Are they providing their own laptop? Yeah. So they uh, providing... It comes back to the old... All yeah, tests have been around for decades. And you can see why. You can <clears throat> see, it's so easy to see why, you know, as the existing parliamentary system catches up and puts these, you know, all this, what is a new form of work into um, the paradigms it understands, it's pretty easy <clears throat> to drag back because there are, I mean, it's not entirely new. It's not, you know, kangaroos and grizzly bears. It's... Yep. Um, it's an evolution of something else and there's plenty that it's evolved from to get to this point, if not in many respects, just replicating it by the technology. There is this sort of difficult um, piece, isn't there, as far as you want to ensure that your gig workers and your contingent workers still have appropriate training and understand the organisation culture for the time that they're there, but not overstepping them and you know, overstepping in that piece and treating them just like every other well, employer. But you know, there is the, yes, you don't want to get the classification wrong, but it's also when they're with you, these gig workers, you want to make sure that they're, they're following your company, you know, your company's values and, um, mm -hmm. and policies and procedures as well. And um, interestingly, interestingly, that itself is another waypoint where um, if the gig economy person narrative that's supporting having them as a gig economy person, you know, supporting your business on a dip in, dip out basis is, um, you know, consistent with, you know, the lawfulness, if you will, of the engagement you're operating under. The, the next waypoint is actually when it's starting to become more expensive mm. to have a gig economy work. I mean, you're paying a higher hourly rate because you're paying for, you know, them to dip in and dip out when you want them to. You um, actually want them to be more, you know, representative of your company and we are perhaps wearing a company uniform or you're giving them very particular sales instructions about the way they should go about it. Mm. And then you say to yourself, well, hang on a minute, I'm offering you lots of security. Why am I paying you this high hourly rate wearing lots of... So and one, one of the things that often gets forgotten is this sort of occupier's liability risk for any member of the public that comes onto your premises. Yeah. And this person's coming and going and have, you know, they might have you know, been given a bit of a you know, safety induction or something like that. But, you know, if something, you know, if the paintbrush does go in the kid's eye or, or their own eye for that matter, um, and, and quite often in certain modern workplaces we have one client who's got a you know a, an automated nerf gun that fires nerfs at people who crash the system and you know that's kind of really cool when you think about it but you know uh and it's all fun and games until someone loses an eye so to speak and then we work out and the lawyers get called in um i guess my point is there's a point there's a waypoint 
in the transition, we actually might want to look at them and how they become employees. Um, not because we're worried about compliance risk, but because it's actually, again, going to be cheaper and more effective for your organisation in terms of the emanation of this person to your clients. And that, that sort of brings us to the end of the life cycle, um, uh, doesn't it? In that it could be that they transition from contractor to employee or indeed their engagement as a gig worker comes to an end, uh, whether that's the end of the project or in certain cases where they're not delivering you know, the service to the required standard mm -hmm. that you might have to execute um, termination rights under the, uh, the service or independent contractor agreement for cause. Or your non-contract again. <laughs> yeah, or your, yes. well, which we've had, you know, recently we've got a case where, um, again, classic sort of, you know, uh, paid for paid for in terms of a, a, a piecework um, and the you know, person was only mm -hmm. kind of writing some articles for three or four weeks and then mm -hmm. has immediately gone off to the ombudsman to say, well, I didn't get paid for the four weeks I was here and then I was separated really quickly. And I said, well, hang on a minute. You, oh, you know, we don't have a contract because it was just understood that, um, you know, we, we just pay for, you know, write us, write us a clever article and we'll, you know, we'll give you, a, you know, 500 bucks for it or whatever the amount of money was. And, um, but now once the ombudsman gets tangled up in it, we're going to get tangled straight into all these um, uh, indicators within the formal case law about whether or not they're a contractor or an employee. And, um, and, and when you've got no contract to speak of, the automatic assumption is going to be, excuse me, be wages, wages for work equals employment. So I am, I am conscious of the time. I, I did say that we would uh, get through it within the hour and, and we have done that. Um, so I think it was a really yeah, interesting discussion and um, as I said, this is the first uh, of our new webinar series and um, we'll be uh, certainly holding um, a few more um, over coming months. So please keep an eye out um, for those topics. We are going to try and keep them conversational like this. Um, Safe the feedback <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, if you do have any questions, um, after today's webinar, we'd love to hear from you or any feedback from, from the session or any way we can improve these going forward. Uh, any closing comments from you, Chris? No, no I really welcome poll from everybody and their observations about uh, gig economy generally um, because mm -hmm. it's something that is um, feeding out there and we see it in our limited way in the underbelly of cases that, you know, where, where problems arise, but we'd love to hear about the other ways in which it's being explored and, and then sort of where to next, because it's that kind of narrative that, you know, we often get asked by policymakers about, well, what should be the regulatory settings in relation to these things? And, you know, without line of sight about, you know, thinking through the broader horizons that, you know, the future of work holds, um, then, you know, that, that's going to be a limited contribution. It's going to be about the same old cases and the same old, you know, nonsense. And I think this whole area needs to break into its own paradigm in the way that it is, but you know, the empire is striking back right now and yes. you know, we need to you know, keep ahead of the game. And perhaps returning of the Jedi after that. <laughs> uh, well, someone else anyway, but no, thank you all for coming along. I hope it was good and uh, yeah, look forward to catching up soon. And thank you, Chris, and, and thank you, Josephine.